So if you take a chart, and there's the next chart clearly shows you that, that the traditional model used to be a two-dimensional map, typical average better than economy growth. If the economy is growing at 3, 4, 5%, you should be growing at 6, 7, 8% kind of a notion. And you have a portfolio of companies that delivers the growth and profitability. I call it as a conglomerate holding company model, which is the lower left box of that particular chart. Now what you do is that you go away from a portfolio management approach to, in fact, a refocusing back on the core business. And rather than having average growth, acceptable growth, you begin to go into very aggressive growth. So the new strategy is very simply grow the core business. And that's exactly the topic of this particular presentation and the title of this presentation, grow the core business and how do we do this thing? By the way, in the late 80s and the early 90s, a lot of authors began to write articles about this stuff. The famous article, of course, is the theory of core competency. C.K. Prahalad and his student Gary Hamill wrote a classic paper in Harvard Business Review talking about why core competency is very important to understand. And this began to take as a new journey, how do we grow the core business? So that's where we are going to talk about how do we grow the core business. What I will show you around here is another chart. Very quickly, we have two charts in succession, unfortunately, this time, although I like to pace them a little more. Here is a very busy chart. It's a three by three matrix. It says, for example, at the upper left corner, you must define what is your core business. Just find out what business you are in. While we may have all the debates what business we are in, are we in the railroads business or transportation business, all that stuff, the reality says that your current revenues and the growth and your current profitability and the cash flow are coming from your existing products and existing markets or customers. So you need to pin that one down. What are your current products or services, if you are in a service business, or a mix of the two? And what are your current markets and the customers? A lot of debate can go on in a company. In fact, this chart I've used in about 20 different companies. And the hardest thing actually is to define that core business taking a product market matrix approach. A lot of debates go on. We get a consensus among managers, senior executives, and simply say, OK, we do agree that based upon the revenues that we are deriving, these are our products, and these are our markets by and large. That's you define the core business. The idea that I'm going to promote in this particular presentation is that core business is the best business. It is the number one choice, and we need to revitalize and grow the core business. In fact, I strongly believe that neither the technology nor the markets give up on a business. It is the managers who give up on a business. There is huge life still left into very mature technologies, but we give it up. As soon as we see an alternate substitute technology coming in, we begin, my God, the existing technology is already a dinosaur. We as managers make them dinosaurs. And there are some dandy examples I found, for, for, for example. When the computers were coming in, people thought paper is gone now. Do you know that actually paper has grown with more and more computerization? We thought the same way in the computer business. Now that we have PCs and now we have the wireless technology, the traditional mainframe computers will be gone. Actually, mainframe computers are growing at the same time. While we may believe that we are into this new foods because of the health concerns or aging of the population or any of the demographics that we talk about, the traditional foods are still very popular. So I have learned the lesson that markets are the last ones to give up on a product or a technology. It is the managers who do it first. Now, why would managers do it? Because managers are rewarded for conquering the next mountain, which is their career path. Managing traditional legacy business gets you nowhere. Creating a new business, creating a new excitement, creating a new brand is the new challenge. And therefore, it is the management career pathing and reward system that plateaus markets and technologies Actually, markets and technologies have 
lot of life, almost I would call it an eternal life. Very few exceptions. Technologies of today were actually invented more than 100 years ago, and we are still using them. Whether those are in processed foods, automobile, or those are in fact technologies that we take it for granted today, pretty much in day-to-day -day living. So I believe very strongly that what we will do in this session is to really go into depth about what are the strategies companies have figured out to grow the core business. It does not mean that you do not get out of the box number one as it shows you in the chart. There is a way of getting out of the box number one. For some reason, we all agree in the company that the core business is not going to grow. And I'll give you some examples later on. Then we need to diversify, but this is a discipline, the diversification. It is not just a random diversification using financial approach to say, what's a good business to be in? But it is systematically diversifying into adding more products on existing markets and customers across, you can go around. We call it related products or services. And ultimately, altogether new products and services. There's a discontinuity, altogether new. Generally, box number three going across is much more difficult than box number two. Or one can go down where you take your existing product and service and search for newer markets where those products and services are equally useful with small modifications. So we call them as related markets and related customers. And that seems to work pretty well. Or one can go down into the third box, which is altogether new products or services. Again, there's a discontinuity there. Just like altogether products and services is much harder, altogether markets and customers is much harder at the same time. And we'll give you some examples of companies that have failed and companies that have succeeded. In this chart, which is a three by three matrix, there's a fourth uh, box out there. The fourth box actually is at a diagonal, where you are simultaneously moving from the core business into a related product and into a related technology. While it is very close to the core business, the general recommendation is that don't do it. Simultaneously making both changes internally will paralyze you. The technologists won't agree along with the marketing guys. And therefore, you need to probably not do it. If you have to go into box four, go through an acquisition which is strategic and synergistic to the core business, which is box four and box one will have a huge synergy. Or, as we will show you later on, you go across adding a related product and then go down adding related market or customers. Or you go down go into related markets, and then in that market, add the related product by and large. So box four is much more complicated uh, than what looks like an obvious thing to do. If you look at it in this particular chart, there are three boxes have shaded dark, which says, don't go there at all. Not in this journey that you start out. You have a lot of growth left into other boxes. Out of the nine boxes, you are basically away from um, three boxes you are not engaged in. But there are six more boxes that you can play quite a lot. In fact, of the six boxes, largest opportunity may be just in one box, which is box number one, which is existing products and services and existing, in fact, uh, customers and markets by and large. So what we will do is to focus on that for the next uh, several, maybe almost half an hour or so before we switch over to box number two, box number three, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I've found is I've applied this model into many, many companies. And I've taught this several times in my executive education programs, as well as into my regular MBA classes at many, many universities. I find fascinating that core competency to succeed in a business is not unidimensional. There are two dimensions minimally necessary. You have a vertical dimension that has to do with something about product, service, technical, technology, or I call it strictly operational competency, which means you know what to do. The other side is the existing market customers, which is the other side, which is what I call a marketing competency. 
You don't become successful unless you have both the technical competency or operational competency and marketing competition. We have lots of examples. In marketing, we always say, just because you have the better mousetrap does not mean you have a market. You need to know how to market. And we say the same thing, just because you know how to market it, clever commercial, clever slogan does not mean you're going to succeed. You've got to have a good product. In fact, if you don't have a good product, all of your marketing dollars will go to waste anyhow. So you need a dual core competency. And I find in the academic literature or even in the consultancy literature, the notion of a core competency is one dimension rather than two dimensions. Minimum is two dimension. And I can give you lots of examples of companies that are very good in both dimensions. McDonald's. McDonald's is very good in operational excellence. But it is also very good in its marketing. The way it relates to customers and the way it relates to market segments by and large. Uh, Disney, again the same way. Disney World, not only good for the rides, and those rides are very unique, experiential learning, experiential enjoyment, entertainment, but they also know how to, in fact, approach the customers, right? So the what dimension and the how dimension both have to come together. My favorite example is Singapore Airlines. I've flown them many, many times. It is probably the best airline in the world. They, of course, have a very good schedule route. The prices are very correct. But their customer service is superb. They know exactly how to recruit the right flight attendants, put the smile on their face, and they do this superb customer service excellence. So they again have a dual core competency. Very important to understand. I just wanted to emphasize that a little more than usually I do because we generally think if you have a good product, world will come to our path, beat our path, not, does not happen. If you are a good huckster, advertisers, promotional gimmicks, etc., people will buy our products. Yes, in the short run you may buy, but not in the long run. A lot of deceptive things that you see, in fact, in direct marketing often happens because there is not a good product, but there's a good hype. A lot of the diets that we hear about, for example. In fact, most of the problems that FTC investigates, Federal Trade Commission, and now SEC is investigating where you get the stock tip. Have you heard about that from the latest one? Actually, the hype is great, but there is no substance behind. So you need both the sizzle as it is shown, but also the stake at the same time, which is the same thing. You have to have a what dimension and the how dimension by and large. So let's go into this journey and talk about this area. How not to grow the business. The traditionally, when the Box number one, which is existing products, existing markets, is a mature business. In my earlier chart, it will be low growth, high cash flow, traditional business, what we call cash cow, or I call it cash pig business. The typical notion would be, let me gain more market share at the expense of competition because the market is not growing. So my only fight is market share fight now, rather than grow the total market. And generally, most companies use three different marketing weapons. They engage in price wars, or they engage in advertising wars, or they engage in trade wars, which means uh, their sales channels, primarily B2B, it's very common. Business to business marketing, it's very common. And in packaged goods, consumer goods, usually you have the price wars or you have the advertising wars. Price wars are everywhere, both industrial products and consumer products. While these are the traditional approaches to growing the core business, however, they grow the business at the expense of profits and cash flow. I'll give you some quick examples. I mean, it's really painful to see what is happening to the full line, full service, major airlines in the world, not just in America. United Airlines, American Airlines, Delta, US Air, uh, Northwest Airlines, they all are having these huge price wars. I remember, in fact, when I was awarded the Marketing Educator of the Award by Sales and Marketing Executive Education, I think it was in 1991. It was in Nashville at the Opryland. I received my award at a luncheon meeting, and at the same time, Robert Crandall, who was the CEO of American Airlines, also came there. He also got the award as the Practitioner of the Year Award. I listened to his, uh, you know, his speech, 
And his comment was saying that, look, this is unfair competition. After a complete deregulation of the airline industry under President Carter, the Big Bang Theory, as we call it, all price uh, monopolies or price regulation was abolished. CAB, which was the uh, price management uh, regulated cartel you know, agency, Bangladesh, it was gone. FAA was only for safety reasons primarily. Airlines will be strictly privatized. Uh, actually, they were privatized, but will be allowed to compete against each other was the notion. Many airlines collapsed in the process. And now in 1991, uh, Bob Crandall, who is a, absolutely an icon in the industry, complaining bitterly that companies like America West and companies like Northwest, Continental, were getting away because they could declare Chapter 11, and therefore they are not held accountable to shareholders. Government should do something. Government did not do anything. And guess what? Next year, he announced the biggest price war in 1992, is my memory. And the biggest price war was 50% price reduction across all of the routes of American Airlines. Immediately, United Airlines had to follow. Delta had to follow. They were all major competitors to each other. And guess what? In less than six months, American lost more than a billion dollars. United lost about the same amount. And Delta lost about $600 million. Why? Because the price cut was much more aggressive than the, than the demand that would be created. If the demand grew by more than 50%, when you reduce price, 50% makes sense. So this was a disastrous strategy, and the airline industry has never recovered from that time. Isn't that interesting? And at the same time, niche airlines are coming on board. You see, in fact, Southwest Airlines, the traditional niche player, highest market cap, its market cap is more than all major airlines put together. But you see Airtran in Atlanta, for example. You see a Blue Jet around here. You see, in fact, or JetBlue. And you see in Europe the same way, Ryanair. Many, many of these niche guys have come on board doing relatively well. So price wars is bad business especially if you cannot grow the market. It's a great thing to do, two companies both aggressively doing, engaging in price wars, if you can grow the total market. Both can come out as winners. If the market cannot be grown, either because it's already mature, or there's an economic downturn and people don't want to buy at any prices, both companies will collapse. As we have seen uh, price wars in cola wars, as we call them, in, you know, Coke versus Pepsi, as we have seen the beer wars, for example, as we have seen, in fact, in many, many industries. So price wars don't work well. In fact, I've seen the same disastrous scores using price as a weapon between companies like uh, Lockheed, you might remember, uh, companies like McDonnell Douglas and Boeing fighting for the aircraft manufacturing business from the airlines when the airlines were not willing to buy, giving huge price discounts, financing, et cetera, and collapsing in the process pretty much, right? So airlines is a good example how not to do business. Same thing is true long distance. In long distance, they used not only price, but they also used advertising wars. You had this great set of commercials that came out. It was MCI versus AT&T. And guess what? Both of them lost money in the process. AT&T used, in fact, world-class icons, you know, uh, you know, the commercials which were going, you know, f uh, reach out and teach, touch someone was a great commercial, for example. Everybody knew what AT&T was all about, but the prices were crashing faster uh, than the revenues were growing or the market was growing at the same time. And AT&T ended up spending, creating an AT&T brand from divesture, primarily in long distance, about a billion dollars a year over 10 years, getting nowhere. MCI had this great commercial called Friends and Families, you might remember that. Excellent platform that created through billing and collection mechanism. And again, neither of these companies really fighting against each other went anywhere. So advertising wars get you nowhere, as we have seen in beer industry, as we have seen where advertising is used as a weapon, maybe in cosmetics, etc. So my view around here is that I think this is a bad business, using traditional marketing weapons as a way of growing business. Right now, I'm watching the ISP business internet service providers. Do you know that neither AOL, nor MSN, nor Net Zero, the third company that is created from a merger of two major companies, is making money? They all believe that they will be the last ones to close the lights. 
we will make it up in volume, kind of an argument. They're all engaging in price wars, trade wars, and channel wars, by and large, and getting nowhere. So this is not the way to grow the core business. To way to grow the core business, I found six different strategies. We'll talk about each one of them in some depth and show you how many companies have done that thing. On this chart that you see right now, there are three strategies that I will talk about. The first and probably the best strategy is making synergistic acquisitions. Not any acquisition, but synergistic acquisitions. And I have some good examples to show you. It can be done, and it is done successfully. Exxon merged with mobile. Exxon Mobil became a very synergistic operation because both are very comparable companies. And so long as the government allows you to do this thing, there's no antitrust issue, it's perfectly fine. I saw the same thing when Bell Atlantic and Ninext merged. In fact, in that industry, as an advisor, I used to always talk about saying that in the regulated utility business, like the electric utility or the telephone companies, one must use the farm theory of acquisition and mergers. What's a farm theory? Farm theory says that the best farm to buy is your neighbor's farm because it's the same soil, same climate. Tear down the fence so you don't need two combines or two tractors, which are two CXX positions. You don't need two CFOs, two CIOs, even two CEOs, etc., and you get economies of scale in terms of cost reduction. That's the synergistic uh, uh, acquisition by and large. That's exactly what happened when Bell Atlantic and uh, uh, 9X merged, and then when GTE merged, because now what you get is a huge economies of scale, not just in managing the business, but biggest cost to all these companies is capital expenses they make in upgrading the networks, which means economies of scale in procurement, in buying. If you are a wireless company, and if you are the largest wireless company, let's say in this case Verizon, by having GTE wireless merge with the wireless of two baby bells, you now have a huge economies of scale in negotiating with a supplier like a Nokia or a Motorola. Both in the handset, which you subsidize anyhow, so your cost of subsidy goes down, or as well as in fact in building the network like the base stations, the towers that you see, and the switch in the back and all the software that goes in supporting that switch by and large. Huge economies of scale. So that's where you get the synergy by and large. You get the synergy by economies of scale. So here is a synergistic acquisitions that is possible. And that would be one that I would recommend again and again if you can figure out. Surprisingly, this is very common in the banking business. It's like the farm theory. So you see Southeast banks merging among themselves. You see Northeast banks merging among themselves. You see the west of Rockies banks merging among themselves. Because now you are two banks in the same territory, same farm, you can close down many of the offices. You don't need two locations, like two gas stations across the street, two branches of two banks. You shut down one of them, and you make one more into a, a supermarket or something like that, as we have done in Southeast banks, uh, such as the merger of, for example, Wachovia and First Union, or the merger of Nations Bank and Bank of America. So that's very clear. I think it's a good example. A second approach to, in fact, growing the core business is more and more popular now. It's called key account management or a strategic relationship with your key customers. If you analyze all your data, I don't have a chart here, but I can simply show you, visualize this chart, that if you plot on your x-axis customers, from the highest revenue generating customers as number one to the second highest to the third highest, et cetera, et cetera. And your vertical axis is the revenue that you derive from them. Guess what kind of a curve or a distribution will you see? It is always exponential coming down very sharp. It's also called the Pareto's law in economics. Or in marketing, we call it 20-80 ratio. 20 percent of your customers who pay your bills, you send them an invoice, etc., generate 80 percent of your revenue. Surprisingly, this is a knowledge that is now becoming 
more and more popular in terms of actual practice. We knew this thing many, many years ago. But it is now being used in practice. For example, companies like Ernst & Young found that even though they may have 4,000 clients worldwide, they are actually having concentration of revenue only in the top 400 clients or even less than that, maybe 200 clients. More importantly, these clients still have a lot more potential to grow the business. So you create a key account management system by focusing on that account and identifying what products and services that they are buying or should be buying from you. The concept is not fighting for market share, which is I talked about how not to grow the business, but fighting for share of a customer's wallet or one-stop shop, whatever word you want to use. So you change your matrix the way you measure, create the share of wallet practice account by account. This is not at all unusual in professional services. This is what a typical management consultancy firm has always done, such as a McKinsey or a BCG. This is exactly what ad agencies have always done, for example. This is what the law firms have quite often done by a single client and giving them all practices, whether those are litigation practices or transactional practices. And within transactional, whether those are corporate practices or, in fact, there would be real estate transaction practices. Those are the kinds of things that one needs to do. So it's very possible to do that thing. So key account management. And I'll take a couple of examples here. And the one example that is very important to understand is uh, the key account management process put together in a company called Procter & Gamble. <clears throat> Here is a packaged goods company who suddenly realizes that while they are very consumer-focused households, housewives, and they did everything right, they are absolutely the best in class in marketing. They created world-class brand names excellent R&D organization, understanding what consumers need, want, and working backwards, creating pull marketing. They were the largest advertisers and sales promotion company in the world at one time. They spent more money than anybody. Suddenly realized that they have another customer also called a Walmart. In fact, the story is so interesting that PNG, because it was organized by products or brand names or product groups, did not even know who was their single largest customer. Think about that. Because they were so focused on consumers. Actually, there was a call from Sam Walton, as it is reported in all published literature, who called up the senior most officer in the company, number two person, John Pepper was his name, and told him, look, I'm your single largest customer and I don't like the way you do business with me. Because all of the buyers at Walmart had a nightmare managing different terms and conditions, different schedules for delivery, different approaches to SKUs, stock keeping units, the packaging units, etc. And Walmart had streamlined its operations around hub and spoke supply chain. So they were incurring cost accepting PNG brands into their system. They were the largest buyers of all products put together, but since the PNG did not have a key account management system in place, had no idea. About 12 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, this business was about $500 million at a time when the single largest brand called Tide was about $600 million. PNG suddenly realized there is another perspective we can take. That a channel is not just a contentious relationship, always fighting against the channel, the push marketing versus pull marketing kind of a debate, but channel could be a strategic partner. And that's exactly what has happened. In fact, to me, I would even make the statement that understanding that alone has created more growth for the traditional brand names of PNG that were invented, discovered, marketed 50, 40 years ago. They've got more growth out of those brands by having a key account management relationship with, in fact, Walmart.
I'm told that business today in year 2003 or four is about $12 billion. Think about 500 million going to 12 billion in, uh, let's, say, let's say 15 years, if you wanted to put some timeline. Mind boggling. If you look at the growth annually within Walmart account, it is more than the average growth of the industry. And that's the share of wallet concept. Can you grow more faster in a given account compared to your overall growth in the company and the economy or the industry by and large? And today, that relationship has become much more strategic. Walmart is the largest retailer. They bet probably on the right horse in this case. Walmart as the rising retailer. The traditional anchorage of uh, grocery products to grocery companies like Kroger, Safeway, etc. These are the new retailers, Target, Walmart, Kmart, etc. And as Walmart has gone into Canada, guess what? PNG is riding that, uh, riding that wave essentially. And all of a sudden, PNG's market share of the same branch is growing in Canada. They are now having neck and neck and might even surpass Unilever brands, which was traditionally because Canada is a part of the British Commonwealth, Unilever had a huge advantage in Canada. As Walmart goes now into the heart of Unilever territory called England, and has become the third largest retailer about to become number two, guess what? PNG's share of the British market will grow at the same time. As Walmart goes into Germany, the same thing is going to happen. Against Henkel, they couldn't compete very well using the traditional trade wars, advertising wars, I'm talking about advertising and price wars to enter German market, but guess what? Walmart will make them. Walmart is what I would call a market maker. So key account management, identifying those market makers and creating a strategic relationship creates enormous growth that's possible out of your existing mature products and services by and large. And by the way, this is learned by companies like ABB. This is learned by companies like General Electric. This is learned by companies like Siemens, Alcatel, Lucent, Nortel. They're all doing the same thing, essentially. Suddenly, they've discovered that fighting for the share of the wallet is a Good idea, especially in a mature industry by and large, as opposed to fighting for market share. And the last strategy in this particular chart that I'll talk about is looking after what I would call vertical markets. In other words, what you're doing is looking at the world of markets and customers in a slightly different way. By segmenting in a way which says there are so many applications and those applications can create further growth. So typical vertical markets in business to business are created using what is called the SIC codes, standard industrial classification. At a four level digit code or at a five digit code, wherever it's appropriate. And the best companies that are done always very well because it seems almost mandatory is software companies, companies that provide software. Microsoft on the one hand, Oracle on the other hand, would be, in fact, companies like SAP out of uh, Germany, uh, would be IBM on the software side, et cetera, or people who are into system integration like IBM, same thing happens, where you have to customize quite a lot. And the application of the same computing technology is very unique and different, and therefore you begin to grow by downstreaming. Product is not just off-the-shelf product, but it requires special installation, maintenance, et cetera. You begin to grow the money. And therefore, vertical markets is a second, I mean, third major strategy that I recommend generally. Identify how to break up the market into vertical segments where each segment will require your core competency in a slightly different way, unique way, and they're willing to pay more for that as a way of doing it. Another industry that I worked, which I found the same thing besides software, is semiconductors, the chip making people. Chip making people always find that a memory chip is not a memory chip. A memory chip that goes into cameras is very different than a memory chip, for example, that goes into a PC, which is very different than a memory chip that goes, for example, let's say, into a television set. They're all memory chips. So you begin to organize by your customer segments 
which are very different applications by and large. I'll take the next three strategies, which are the much more traditional ones. There are three more strategies, and this time I'll talk about multiple channels. As the industry gets organized historically, usually it is locked into a given channel paradigm. It begins to think only from that channel viewpoint. If you are selling directly, you think direct selling is the only way to do it, as business to business companies have found, such as IBM, such as AT&T. Or you might go into direct selling, such as, for example, cosmetics, like A1 Cosmetics. Or direct selling, as Dale Computers is doing right now, suddenly you realized, I may have to create a blend of direct and indirect sales, right? So you can sell your products through not just direct selling, but the reverse, or the opposite. Opposite is more interesting, where you might have actually indirect sales. You are going through distribution channels, a wholesaler, a retailer, or what we call a distributor and a dealer in industrial markets. And suddenly you realized you have customers who are so worldwide that they are not geographic centric as your channels are. And therefore, you have to deal with them directly. I remember an incident here about this conflict between channel conflict, which is most companies go through. I find fascinating at 3M company when I was working as an advisor. They have this world-class event annually, which is a marketing excellence, sales and marketing excellence, internal competition among all the divisions, and the best in class wins an award, something in advertising campaigns, something in sales, something in you know, pricing, whatever it is. And it's a chairman's award. Maybe 10, 11 different awards are given. Six, 700 people show up, and they usually have a speaker. I would be sometimes a keynote speaker myself. This time, I remember they brought a CEO of a largest single customer. Remember that key account management I talked about earlier? Largest single customer of 3M. He came in and actually showed in his presentation hundreds and hundreds of products he was buying and raised the question, tell me who am I? Like a mystery guest. Except for a handful of people who knew him and had brought him as a speaker, most people did not know because like Procter & Gamble, 3M was organized by product divisions. But here was one single customer who was buying it, and that turned out to be GSA, Government Services Administration. Isn't that interesting? He was the largest customer. So now he says, I want to do business directly with you. Why should I go through different channels? Which has led to creating, therefore, a direct business channel and an indirect business channel. Best examples I have here given on the chart are publishing industry. Most publishing industry would have, in fact, their own uh, go through bookstores like Simon & Schuster, for example, or you know, any one of the large publishers. Now they're finding you can sell directly through mail or you can go on Amazon. In fact, Amazon has become the largest single retailer for most publishing houses and has become a market maker, essentially. Again, channel shift. And you can create new channels or you can leverage new channels as a way of growing the business by and large. And as I mentioned, personal computers have figured out that you need to go both direct and indirect. So you can go through large computer chains like CompUSA but also have a corporate account, as HP is trying to do, balancing both channels at the same time. This strategy is very viable, except it is always very, very difficult to implement. Internal loyalty to channels are almost fanatical. And therefore, you have a lot of internal discussions and conflicts and flights, uh, fights that I've seen in many, many companies that I've worked in this particular area. But you have to have these channels. In fact, I can give you a story. It just occurred to me. Remember AT&T before the divesture? AT&T actually also was a manufacturer which they spun out called the Lucent today. AT&T had 1,800 phone centers, which was primarily cost-saving because in the old days as a monopoly, AT&T came, sent a technician to your house to do number changes, wiring changes. And the cost of sending the technician to your house 
which was not paid by the customer because it was free quote unquote service subsidized by long distance rates was expensive. So it was a cost reduction strategy by saying, can we design the telephones so that we have a jack, just like people plug in their appliances, they should be able to plug in the telephones. And they did that thing, which is what we use today. Very simple. Before the wireless technology came. I'm talking about the landline fixed wire technology. Now the question came, how do we distribute this thing so it becomes a do it yourself, the customers can do it themselves. Well, the first notion was that, look, we are not a retailer. Why don't we simply have customers come and pick up at our uh, billing stations where people come to pay their checks? Unfortunately, there, people did not want to come to downtown areas. They wanted where the shops are, which is the suburban shopping centers. So they decided to finally roll out a complete retail strategy, 1,800 phone centers, largest retail network. Competition also was coming in the phone area. Government had deregulated the telephone set business. So companies like GE were planning to come. Panasonic from Japan was planning to come. And suddenly it realized that 1,800 phone centers was not sufficient to compete in what looked like a consumer electronics product now. You have to have almost 18,000 retail outlets. And there's no way you could roll out 18,000 outlets, even if you had the money. You could not sign up enough leases, for example, in time to have equal power in terms of distribution system. You may have a good product, good price, but you have to have a distribution system. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. We went, my advice was to go indirect distribution at that time. In fact, close down many of the 1,800 phone centers which were not profitable, but align with largest retailers in the company, such as Target, such as Sears, Walmart was not there at that time in our radar screen, but could be Walmart today, for example. Walmart is a market maker. Walmart is the largest film processing. Walmart today distributes more DVD players than anybody. 35% of the share goes through Walmart. So one could go into that channel. So many, many of these things requires multiple channels, okay? Next strategy that we have figured out, quite a few places, which is very possible, is multiple brands. Come out with more than one brand. I worked on this project at Whirlpool Corporation. You had two brand strategy, which is why Whirlpool is always number one. You have the traditional Whirlpool brand, but before that one, Whirlpool was primarily a small family-owned company called Upton Machine Company, Upton Family, in the southern Michigan area, what is known as uh, St. Joseph Benton Harbor area. Sears, as a customer, discovered them. Sears always wanted a private label, which is what they made, called Kenmore brand of appliances. Sears is the one who made them into full line appliance company, from strictly a washing machine company to dryers, to refrigerators, to range, everything. Kenmore brand is number one. Then eventually Whirlpool decided to go with a second a brand, which is a channel strategy and a brand strategy, came out with its own brand, Whirlpool, distributed through independent retailers, and they did a very good job. So two brand strategy worked very well, but as we looked into the demographics going forward, we found that this mid-price point brands, Kenmore and Whirlpool, are not going to grow as fast as, as two extremes, because in America, we have a permanent decline of the middle income and the rise of the affluent on the one hand and the rise of the new poor on the other hand which led to the acquisition of KitchenAid as a brand, because in the high-end market, the premium market, most appliance makers were one product primarily, so KitchenAid only made dishwashers. You might remember a name called Jenner, which was eventually bought out by their competition. Jenner only made a range, electric stove. You had brands which were sub-zero, only made refrigerators. So KitchenAid was available as a brand, that's what Whirlpool bought the brand, and made it into full line, and rest is history, uh, that KitchenAid brand is doing very, very well at the high end, the premium box. So you have the value box, which is Whirlpool and Kenmore. The premium box is KitchenAid as a brand. And then the third brand they're rolling out now is at the low end of the market to make sure that low-priced products don't compete and destroy their Whirlpool and Kenmore loyalties. 
So they're coming out with a brand name called Roper, R-O-P-E-R. Uh, it's basically a natural gas stove company, but they're making it into a full line company. So multiple brands is not a bad strategy. I've seen this thing, Marriott Corporation doing the same thing for growing the hospitality business. In addition to Marriott chains, they came out with a very successful brand name called Courtyard by Marriott, more affordable Marriott kind of a thing with all the frills basically gone that you have in a typical full service restaurant and conference convention center, uh, you know, marriage weddings kind of a thing place as a typical Marriott would be. And they'll come out with other brand names like Hampton Inn, et cetera, and they're going into Marriott Suites, uh, Residency Inn, just goes on multiple brand strategy. In hospitality industry, this is a very common, uh, common approach. The, the Holiday Inn Group, which is the bus companies, which is now sold to somebody else, they've done the same thing. Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn Express, uh, you know, the Embassy Suites, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And the last example I can give you around here why multiple brands have sustained the company growing the same core product is Seiko watch company out of Japan. While Seiko is a mainstream watch, they came out with a premium watch company which is called La Salle, L-A, capital S-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which is more like a designer watch competing using a great styling and design, sold primarily through jewelry stores or high-end department stores slightly above where Seiko is sold in terms of price points. Watch, of course, is higher priced, probably by two or three times. And at the low end, they have come out with another brand name called Pulsar. Pulsar will go into your grocery store, uh, typical, in fact, drug stores, for example, and maybe at the low end of mass merchandises like Walmart, Sears, etc. And they basically manage the channels as well as brands so that they can penetrate the market deeper and deeper and get, in fact, a higher share of the market without price reduction, without trade wars, without advertising wars. Last strategy to grow the core business, which I find fascinating, is really targeting emerging markets. Best way to understand emerging markets, my recommendation here is to watch the demographics. In my sessions on changing demographics, as a determinants of market trends, I've talked about this one. You know, we have the aging of the population, and guess what? Because of the aging of the population, we, our food habits are changing. There are new markets emerging. Everybody wants to have something that is, uh, you know, no fat. Everybody wants organic, natural foods, fastest growing part in the typical traditional business, which is a food business by and large, right? You can find very easily aging of the population, creating opportunities. Working women households creating opportunities. Ethnic markets, as America becomes more and more ethnic population growing faster than the WASP population. In fact, the forecast is that by 2020, minorities collectively will become the majority of this nation. California already is more than 50% non-white population. Texas is likely to be the number two state, likely to become the same way. Growth of the ethnic markets is another fueling things. So companies have found out in cosmetics that they have to prepare different types of cosmetics. Brand name may be the same. In this case, channels would be the same, but the variety of the product is very different when you cater to the African-American population or even when you cater to the Hispanic population or the Asian population by and large. The physical needs are very different. The color complexion, the skin color complexion is very different, et cetera, et cetera. So in the hair products, cosmetic products, you can see now they're expanding the product line using the same brand or different brands and same channels and sometimes different channels by and large. So that's another area that I found very fascinating. And by the way, what is happening in ethnic markets is not limited to cosmetics, but across many, many product lines, for example. All of a sudden, because of the ethnic uh, diversity, we find that the growth of salsa is faster than the growth of ketchup. Or the growth of, in fact, uh, chips, tortilla chips, is faster, faster than the growth of potato chips by the same thing. So this is a third uh, strategy in the second half, a total of six strategies with which one can grow the business, give you enormous opportunity to grow the business. So far, we have talked about growing the core business in box number one with six different strategies. 
And as I mentioned earlier, box number one is where there is a lot of potential in existing products and existing markets. It is the managers who give up on products and markets. Markets don't give up, products don't give up. But there are situations where it is necessary to grow outside of the box, which is box number one. How do we grow in a more disciplined way where the chance of failure is less and chance of success is more is the whole presentation that I'll be doing now. According to the theory and the model, the best place to grow is next to the core business, which is box number two. And there are two alternate strategies. One is to stay with the existing markets and customers. So if you are domestic, stay domestic, but then add more products and services. And the other one, of course, is stay with existing products and services and add more markets that you have not catered so far. However, before we go into box two, either horizontally or vertically, or get out of the box one, the three criteria must be met. So on the next slide, I've shown three criteria that must be met actually to really migrate into box number two, either horizontally or vertically. Is the market in that box growing faster than the core business? That's the first thing. You are going for growth, so that must be growing faster than the core business. Otherwise, you will have in a sort of averaged uh, growth of the two businesses, you will dilute or average altogether. So it should be growing faster than the core business. Second condition, it should be more profitable than the core business. You should not go into an area where you will jeopardize your current profitability. So it should be a higher growing or faster growing and higher margin business. Those two are very obvious. But the third condition that I have discovered between failure and success has to do with that there should be no entrenched competition in that new box that you are trying to go. Should be no entrenched competition. If there is an entrenched competition, then as you enter their market, they will either stop you there and even may attack you in your core business by and large. Typical competitive reaction. So those three conditions are very key to understand. Is it growing faster than your core business? Is it more profitable than your core business? And there is no entrenched competition. So now, the last criterion is very key to understand because I try to analyze why IBM, a world-class company, with such a strong loyalty of its customers, the Fortune 500 companies, with mainframe computing, eventually data networking services they were offering, they try to go across on horizontal way into box number two by adding office equipment, and they failed miserably. By the way, the reverse happened when Xerox tried to go from office equipment, which is their core business, box one, into what they considered as a relative business, which is computing, computers. Both failed miserably. Why? Mainly because there was an entrenched competitor. In the case of IBM, Xerox was waiting there to basically somehow protect its own business. And in the case of Xerox, IBM was waiting in the mainframe computing business to protect its computer business by and large, which says that even though customers were the same, in this case, one-stop shop could not happen. So this is very key to understand, that we must have no entrenched competition to succeed into disciplined diversification that I have been talking about. If you want to grow through by adding more products, which is horizontal going across, a successful product growth, the next slide shows you, is through internal development, create more through R&D internally, new product lines, or through marketing alliances, which means you have somebody else's products that you will be distributing, selling, etc., because you have access to the market. You are a market maker, essentially requires, however, for you to do a market core competency. You are very strong in marketing. Then you can go across. And generally, I measure strength of a company in marketing by four competitive criteria. First one has to do with your business reputation. Basically, 
reputation of the company by and large, uh, company reputation, business reputation. Are you a company, people are willing to do business, there's a trust factor, no matter what you sell, they believe in what you sell would be a good product for them, good value for them. Second one has to do with market access and infrastructure. Logistics, databases, etc., become very valuable as a hidden asset. These are all intangible assets in some fashion, not reported in the balance sheet. Third one has to do with your distribution and sales network. And the last one has to do with your customer support organization. Those are the four marketing assets generally that become very valuable as you begin to diversify in a disciplined way by adding more products and services to your existing markets and customers. And I have examples for each one of them as we go into the future. We'll show you some examples into uh, specific companies. I'll just lay the framework right now for you. Next area, of course, is that if you want to go down, which means you want to grow on existing products and services, a successful market growth through internal sales and marketing or outside channel alliances requires product core competency. You must have operational excellence, you must have product excellence by and large. And again, like market core competency, I've identified four criteria on which you can measure yourself to have a very strong product core competency or operational core competency. Our first one is cost efficiency. Are you really having a cost advantage over somebody else or can you create one such as through, for example, outsourcing manufacturing, such as, for example, getting contractual manufacturers, how are you do it? Second one is that is your product and technology versatile so that through innovation you can create additional value for other markets. Computer is the most versatile technology I've found. By the way, another technology more versatile, I think, than computer is baking soda. Think about baking soda. You can bake breads, which is how it was designed, but baking soda also is a great cleanser. Therefore, you can make a laundry detergent out of that one. Or you can, in fact, have teeth cleaning, toothpaste out of the whole thing. Baking soda also is an odor killer. S cut smells, reduces smells. So you can make it into a cat litter box, or you put it in your refrigerator. It just goes on and on. These are all market expansions on an existing product, by and large. Or is the product or service capable of doing value-add capabilities? Generally, capital goods are always value-add capable because in order to buy capital goods, customers need financing. That's a value-add service. As General Motors has found, GMAC, which is General Motors Acceptance Corporation, is one of the largest financing organizations in the country, financing automobiles, but also uh, real estate, you know, car, uh, residential homes by and large. So that's a possibility. And when you sell an automobile, you also, in fact, sell all of the repair maintenance services. That's a value-add capability. This happens generally in capital goods, I find. Surprisingly, it does happen, in fact, in many cases like consulting professional services where once a company adopts a recommendation, has to implement the recommendation. And therefore, one can say, we will not only create the strategy design, but we will also implement that for you. A consultancy company like Bain Company, which is like a spin-off of BCG, suddenly figured out as they were dealing with medium-sized corporations, that some of the strategy execution required capital. So they came out with a Bain capital model, providing also not only consultancy services, but also private equity fund, fund uh, to, to the company. So they become investment bankers, essentially, at the same time. That's a value-add capability. And the last platform that is very appropriate to create uh, value out of your products for other markets is what I call mass customization. Mass customization is a concept which is a contradiction, oxymoron. But it is a very powerful concept. It says that is your technology organized? Are your operations organized so that you can get the scale efficiency of making just one unit as good as making, in fact, hundreds of units or thousands or millions of units or millions of transactions if you are a service company? The best example of a mass customization I've found is, uh, in this particular case, a Motorola company, a Motorola pager factory in Florida. I'm told that they put together what is called flexible manufacturing, mass customization. And out of the same pager factory, they can make 
as many as 20 million combinations of pages. There are six things involved. You have the shape, size, function, features, guts, and the design. By the way, when they went into this flexible manufacturing or mass customization, you have a zero inventory now. They don't make products to be warehoused and sold or shipped out. They wait for the orders to come electronically now from the paging companies or retailers. <clears throat> and the cycle time has gone enormously from what used to take four hours to make a pager, now it takes only four minutes, 60 times improvement in the speed. The error rate has gone down. They're very famous for Six Sigma practice, as you know. So Six Sigma used to be, in fact, somewhere around 5.3 or 5.4. It has gone to 5.7 or 5.8, almost no defects. Because at Six, six Sigma, you're talking about one defect in billion uh, operations by and large, which means basically zero defect by and large. And the total customer satisfaction process also is much better because now they can create packages or bundles of pagers, different colors, and ship it out to different locations so that that value add work that has to be done by the customer does not have to be done. Factory can do it for you. Mass customization is a very key concept, therefore. And you think about this one. To me, I always talk about mass customization as the difference between a French restaurant and a Chinese restaurant. French restaurant, how many choices do you have? Very limited menu. The chef has a pride of that menu, the recipe. He does not want to change that recipe for anybody. No flexibility. And how are the prices? At a French restaurant, prices are very high. How often do you eat there? You eat only occasionally because affordability is an issue. Time is, so you go to major events like anniversaries, you know, or weddings or something like that. Contrast that, and how long does it take to get your meal, by the way, at a French restaurant? It takes forever. They turn the tables only once in the evening. You go to the Chinese restaurant, and guess what? Even in a small Chinese restaurant, how big is the menu? 120 items easily listed. Do you think they have 120 separate recipes? They don't. All they have is probably six ingredients, four condiments, and they can make infinite combination any way you want it, right? If you want a little more spicy, they put more spicy. If you want a little less spicy, less spicy. And how fast do you get your meal? You get your meal almost instantly. You just order it, you are talking, suddenly your meal comes, right? And how are the prices? Prices are highly affordable, which means they can cater to different price segments in the marketplace better than a French restaurant can do. And what's true of Chinese restaurants is true of Thai restaurants. It is true of, in fact, Indian restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a new model, which is mass customization, mass personalization, as it is called. If you have that capability in your product, in your service, you are more likely to go after newer markets and still make money. Mm -hmm.